pledge a presentation of the new Enterprise Forum, or NEF. NEF is an Ann Arbor-based not-for-profit corporation founded in 1986 to help entrepreneurs prosper and grow. I am Lee Gorman, coach and consultant to startups and early stage companies, and a member of the NEF Board of Directors. For more than 25 years, we've linked entrepreneurs to management expertise, potential joint venture partners, mentors, business services, capital, and other critical resources. NEF focuses on teaching entrepreneurs how to effectively communicate with potential investors and has gained a reputation as being the preeminent provider of coaching services for investment-ready, high-growth potential businesses. At the center of that coaching is a prototypical 10-minute investor pitch designed to help entrepreneurs ensure that they include the right stuff to get an invitation to that critical second meeting. Today, we'll see a fictitious example of that pitch presented by an entrepreneur and critiqued by a panel of experts. You'll learn about the critical elements of a pitch and how they weave together to create a compelling story. There will be plenty of time for Q&A, so please plan to participate. Note that some aspects of this pitch may seem real. However, the entire pitch, including all the statistics, are entirely fictional and for educational purposes only. So there is no need to whip out your checkbooks. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. The presentation is being videotaped for later viewing, so it's important to use a microphone when you ask questions. When we get to the Q&A portion, I ask that if you have a question, you come to the center aisle here where the microphone is. You can tilt it up and down um, depending on your height, and uh, you can ask questions so the audience can hear you. Um, also, please turn off the noisemakers you have, the ring on your cell phone, that kind of thing, so we don't disturb anybody. Our four panelists today are all members of the NEF board, active in the local entrepreneurial support community. You can read more about each of them on the ACE website. First, Bill McPherson, the incoming president of the New Enterprise Forum, is the managing director of McPherson Commercial Capital, providing funding solutions and business planning and financial structuring assistance to a variety of businesses and investors. He has assisted in arranging funding for startups, growth needs, restructuring situations, and acquisitions of businesses. To his right, Helen Ewing, founder of the Ewing Group, has coached numerous entrepreneurs through several organizations. Helen coaches companies from various sectors, including manufacturing, advanced materials, medical devices, alternative energy, and B2B uh, software as a service models. Next to her, Frances Glory has over 25 years of successful experience in international executive management, consulting, and entrepreneurship, and has been involved with several startups, turnarounds, and successful exits. He is currently Director of International Sales for Tangent Medical Technologies. And Victor Brant Neris is active in consulting and coaching early stage companies employing the business model canvas approach to business planning. He is currently the director of Ann Arbor Sparks Entrepreneurial Boot Camp and a mentor to students in the Masters of Entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan. And now, with our showcase presentation, is Jerry Roston, immediate past president of the New Enterprise Forum. He is an experienced small business executive who has led companies and multi-million dollar projects. He has successfully managed startup businesses and teams within publicly traded companies, pursued investment opportunities, and brought new products to the market. Jerry will be presenting today under his alias, Walt Wilt Whitman. So let's welcome Jerry Roston, Walt Whitman. Good afternoon and thank you for being here. As professional investors, you hear hundreds of business pitches each year. Most of these pitches, pitches are from technologists who honestly believe one of my more famous aphorisms, build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door. In the real world, this is most certainly not true. Even though many of the pitches you hear are based on solid technology and good marketing plans, 
Many of them are so poorly delivered that you fail to hear the message. By not communicating with you clearly, the next Steve Jobs or Sergey Brin may miss the opportunity to revolutionize the world and to provide you, the investor, with an attractive return on your investment. Okay, you've all been there. The entrepreneur gets up in front of the room to present, and 90 seconds later, you're either reading your email or you're fast asleep. Is the reason for your lack of interest the absence of a compelling story or a poor marketing plan? Or is it simply the inability to present to an audience? Well, while many entrepreneurs may be uncomfortable making presentations, it is not the leading cause of the problem. 4C Results, a provider of customer satisfaction data, surveyed professional investors and found that 82% of them attribute poor investor presentations to two factors. The lack of a proper pitch outline and a lack of coaching. In addition, two-thirds of the respondents believe that an inability to properly communicate is strongly correlated with a lack of business success. Given that there is more than $10 billion still available for venture investment, and given that venture funds have a limited lifetime, this inability to ineffectively communicate is costing investors billions of dollars per year. In order to present investors with well-coached businesses, NEF works with economic development corporations to establish local NEF chapters, which offer three services to directly address the problem of poor pitch delivery. First, entrepreneurs working with the local economic development corporations are granted access to the NEF website, which is packed with information to help them build a strong investor pitch. This information is based on NEF's 40 years of closely working with the investor community. Second, the local chapters provide team-based coaching with the specific goal of teaching the entrepreneur how to effectively communicate with you, the investor. Our teams ensure that all aspects of the pitch are logical, concise, and in line with industry norms. Third, the local chapters hold monthly meetings at which entrepreneurs can connect with future teammates, service providers, and potential investors. NEF secret sauce is the brains that it employs to provide content and coaching. Recent non-invasive studies performed at the University of Michigan's medical school have demonstrated that the brains of NEF coaches are different from other brains. NEF coaches' brains show an increased activity in the Wernicke's area. This increased activity is known to be directly correlated with improvements in communication skills. Importantly, the process of transforming a normal brain into an NEF coach's brain is protected by two pending patents. Now, of course, NEF faces competition from a number of sources, including consulting firms such as Deloitte and PwC, groups like Toastmasters, and existing online resources. While each of these contributors, competitors does meet the market's need in a limited manner, none offers the unique combination of benefits provided by NEF. For example, while Toastmasters does help people learn how to be more effective public speakers, they have no expertise with investor pitches and cannot point to quantifiable investor success, whereas NEF coach teams have raised collectively more than $500 million. According to the U.S. Venture Capital Association, the current size of the venture investment market is $45 billion and is projected to grow to $56 billion by 2029. The circles on the map represent the amount of investment in the various cities across the U.S., with the colors representing our stage of expansion. We have identified cities and investors in the Great Lakes region as our beachhead market due to the vast network of contacts we've already established. This region accounts for about $8 billion of annual investment, making the addressable portion of the beachhead market worth about $60 million for NEF. As NEF expands its scope nationally, our total addressable market will grow to $200 million. Our primary customers are angel groups and VC firms who value our services because NEF coach startups have a greater likelihood of achieving a successful exit. Our plan is to charge these customers $50,000 per year, a price which has been validated through in-depth conversations with 40 potential customers. Our secondary customers are the economic development corporations who want high growth potential businesses in their region. We charge them a one-time fee of $20,000 to help them establish needed regional capabilities, build a recruiting plan and recruit coaches, and to train the coaches. Our discussions with 10 of them indicate that they're willing to pay this fee. The final two parties are the coaches and the startups. Our 40 years of experience have demonstrated that coaches participate at no cost for a variety of reasons, 
such as wanting to help, seeking to grow their networks, or even hoping to work for the startups. The 300 plus startups we have coached can attest to the value of our services because they have collectively raised more than $500 million. Now, NEF's technology and process are proven, but what remains to be shown is the ability to scale this business nationally. Thus, our go-to-market strategy is designed to test the scalability on a local, then regional level before going national. We've already contacted the Lansing and Detroit EDCs, and both are anxious to become paying beta customers for our expanded services. Successful expansion into these communities will trigger further regional expansion. We've already started reaching out to Grand Rapids, Cleveland, and Chicago, as our experience suggests that closing a sale requires several months of effort. Our primary marketing efforts will, be focused, will focus on the use of testimonials, coupled with advertising in VCA publications and booths at venture fairs. Expansion nationally will employ a direct sales force due to the high-touch nature of our business. Since our founding in 1986, we have coached more than 300 startups which have collectively raised more than $500 million. With the first round of financing, we will commence pilot projects in Detroit and Lansing. We will expand the pilot to 10 cities in 2027 to be followed by national expansion in 2028. Based on our experience to date, we anticipate coaching 10 startups per year per NEF branch and that the average amount raised per company coached will remain constant. Our team has the skill and expertise to make NEF successful. I'm the CEO of NEF and a recognized authority in the area of communications. Until recently, I served as the VP of Marketing Communications for one of the world's largest publishers. Steve Blank, who's our COO, has held executive management roles with four startups which have gone public, and Tim Geithner, our CFO, has experienced managing the finances for some of the world's largest organizations. With funding, we're going to hire a VP of Social Marketing and a VP of Technology. We've assembled a notable advisory board with key expertise backstopping each of the critical areas of our business. John, who is a well-regarded venture capitalist, brings the voice of the customer. Dale ensures that the, strategy, the strategies we teach will influence people, and Anthony reviews the presentation skills that we use. In 2025, we launched two paying pilot projects in nearby communities, followed by further regional expansion in 2026. In 2027, we will greatly expand our sales and field service teams, allowing us to rapidly grow nationally. By 2029, we anticipate revenues of $20 million, which represents about 10% of our addressable market. We are able to produce uh, attractive returns since our technology is patent-pending, patent pending. COGS are mostly limited to the establishment phase, and most of our revenue sources from repeat customers. To date, NEF has generated annual revenues of $25,000 and has recently received a seed round of $100,000. We are currently seeking a $500,000 Series A round, which will be used to hire a full-time staff, expand our training activities, and support our pilot projects. The 12 months of support provided by this funding will allow us to achieve two milestones. NEF chapters fully operational in four new cities with a total of 10 teams coached, with at least four of them having received a term sheet. Successful completion of these milestones will trigger the Series B round, which will be used to expand our services nationally. Once operating at that scale, we expect to become a target for acquisition by the major consulting firms, as such an acquisition would provide them with a differentiated service offering. With just its Ann Arbor branch, NEF coach teams have raised more than $500 million making NEF the most successful coaching business in the United States. I thank you for your time and invite you to help us expand our services across the entire country. Thank you, Walt. Jerry, that was great. <laughs> and, uh, and I appreciate the humor in it, too. Um, Jerry, I, I do want to start with a question for you. You did a great job not looking at the, at the screen, which we all know is very distracting for the audience. But did I catch you looking at your notes here and there? Uh, you did. Uh, preparing for an investor pitch normally takes 20 to 40 hours of practice. 
Um, and when it's your business, you can afford the time to do that. Unfortunately, I was not able to devote as much time to this as I would normally do for a business that I'm pitching for. So I had to cheat. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll forgive you for that because it was still very, very compelling. Um, so there are many elements of a pitch, the verbal, the uh, words, and the nonverbal, the visual and audible. There's no one right approach for each of these, but it's important to tell a consistent story with all aspects of the story being mutually supportive. Let's ask the panel about some aspects of this and what, uh, what went well and what kinds of things NEF coaches look for when they're helping entrepreneurs prepare their pitch. Uh, I'd like to start with some general questions. Bill, um, what struck you as particularly good or needing improvement about the way Jerry presented the pitch, just overall? Well, I found overall it flowed well, and uh, he, he had good... Uh, message to the, the to the audience didn't as you mentioned did not have to look at the slides which I think is critical because as soon as someone does then you tend to lose the audience yeah oh, okay thanks and by the way if anybody in the audience has a question please just go to the center aisle where the microphone is there and I will acknowledge you and uh, you can ask your question um, Helen how about the information on the slides? You know, if I saw that pitch without hearing Jerry's words, I wouldn't really know what was going on. Shouldn't he have put more information on the slides so I could follow it without listening to him? No, not really, because that serves as a distraction. Um, I saw most of you out in the audience. It's kind of good for me to be able to be staring at you while you were looking at Jerry <laughs> because you were looking at Jerry, and that's the important part glancing to the slides when he was mentioning statistics, but I didn't see you doing this, trying to read things that were maybe too small or a slide that had too much information on it. You were paying attention to what he had to say, and that's very key. And, and what are some good general rules for slide presentations? Keep the words to a minimum. More pictures than words. Big font. That's another good one. Yeah. You want people to be able to see it and not have to think too hard about it. Um, Francis, one truism is that investors have very short attention spans. What did Jerry do to keep your attention? Keep you, you know, he started saying, um, showing the slide with all the people sleeping. What did he do to keep your attention? He didn't keep my attention very well, I must say. Uh, <laughs> no, I think, I think the issue of him reading you know, from his notes, thereby forcing him to a monotone kind of a presentation, there was not enough drama in the presentation. I think you know, to capture people's attention, you need to create a little bit of drama around your presentation. Now, I would say, in Jerry's excuse, obviously, the subject matter is not necessarily particularly, or the product is not particularly exciting in itself in terms of n new invention or anything like this. But I, I thought, I thought, you know, really the, the monotone aspect of the presentation wasn't good enough. Okay. That is a very important point for any of you who are planning to make a pitch in the future. Jerry's a good, very good presenter, and yet he wasn't able to keep the attention because he had to read. He did not spend enough time practicing for that. You get one chance to make this first pitch, so you want to make the best of it. Yeah, and I want to, I want to point out it's not an attack, personal attack to Jerry. He's won many of these competitions for these great presentations. So. Well, no, that's okay. Jerry knows that, and we're, we want to really critique this and say what's good and what's bad so everybody uh, can learn. Um, we have a question from the audience. If you just tilt the microphone down a little. I think you were referring to passion. The passion wasn't there. Passion is good, yeah. My question is, do, does, do visuals always have to come with a pitch? Can you do it without visuals? And is that effective? Do you mean PowerPoint? Um, any kind of visuals, whether it's keynote, PowerPoint, or any. I mean, can you just get up there and, and give your presentation without the visuals? Um, because you always have visuals in that there's you. Right. Well, yes. Right. Yeah. So, but um, which one of the panelists would like to take that one on? Uh, 
I, I, I believe the visual enhanced the presentation, and depending on the format of the meeting, sometimes you're better off having a, you know, not putting the PowerPoint slide up. You know, you have to, in my mind, you have to sort of gauge a little bit the nature of your audience, the number of people, and, and personally, when I'm in that situation, I ask them what they prefer, and they will tell me they would rather have a chat or if they will go for a formal presentation. Thank you. Good question, thank you. We have a couple more. Just line up and I'll take you in order. Okay, how you doing? Um, so maybe I read too much into the fake stuff, so, but the first thing that runs through my mind when I see the numbers, I get really confused because I see a bunch of, you know, what I would consider high price executives. You start adding up those salaries and I look at the dollars, I'm going, I'm out of money before I even build a product, right? So I, I don't understand how to make the connection between driving the dollars out, right? Because I've got to know, how am I going to make money on this and do it now for the amount of investment? So how do I get to that dollar amount? How do I um, calculate that and, and, and sort of project out? The second, ad, the second question would be, I guess it's not a question, it's a statement. Um, so maybe the question of that would be, uh, is there a need to, to sort of reconcile the dollar amounts? Um, it's got to make sense. <laughs> okay, Bill, I was going to ask like, you. Like, the financials, yeah. basically? Yeah. Well, if any, they have to all tie in, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, if they don't, then you lose credibility immediately. And obviously, this is a fictitious case. It, it was, but, but, but even though but, it's fictitious, <laughs> I would hope, though, I mean, from the standpoint, if I was to build a representative, like an exemplar pitch, that would, would seem to me to be very heavy on the management and very light on execution. And that concerns me. Uh, there's a very good reason for that. Victor, would you like to take that one on? Well, I, I think you're underestimating the fact that these are founders. So you're, okay. you're working for your piece of that company. You're not working, sure, if you were at a, down the street at General Motors, that might be a $250,000 job. You're not in that situation. Jerry pointed out that, you know, $25,000 a year, nobody, you know, you have to understand that the people who are working on that are the founders building towards something, building towards that exit. So there isn't, you need to break that string that says <laughs> VP of sales makes $300,000. Right. VP of sales is building a $5 million sales stream so that when he cashes out or she cashes out, he, they cash a check for $10 million. Exactly. And so that's the part I'm not linking is the liquidity, liquidity aspect. How do you get from I sacrificed two years of my life trying to put my kids through school, got bills to pay, and I want to build a business up, and I need cash flow. And that cash flow, granted, it might not be 250000 a year, but it has to be enough for me to not go under and take my business out with it. So that's the part I'm after. Oh, okay. Just so I'm clear, you're asking this question from the perspective of the founder, not the investor. Right. But as a, as a founder, don't I have to convince the investor that I will be successful? I'm not going to go under because I, got, I can support the cash that I'm asking for is substantial enough to support the burn rate or whatever. I need those equations, right? You need to have those equations, but I'll share with you that investors, they don't want you to starve to death, but they don't want you to go out to nice restaurants either. Right. They, they need to know that you have skin in the game and that you are committed to driving this forward because they're not going to be in your offices every day. Okay. So you're selling your vision. You're selling your belief in this product and this idea. So the understanding is we all understand that those financials are probably the most fictitious part of this entire presentation. Mm -hmm. That business model, the, the problem statement, the solution statement, and the business model slides are what are qualifying you to the investor and saying this person understands what's going on and I'm going to invest yeah, there's a wonderful saying out here. Investors don't bet on horses, they bet on jockeys. They're betting on you understanding what you're doing. Okay. And, and I would add to that also that more than ever, and this is an increasing trend, investors are looking for capital efficiency. You used to be able to put a business plan together, go to venture capital, you liked the business plan, he gave you several million dollars to start your business. That's not the way it is today. They want to they want to invest the big dollars when they're sure it's going to work. And that means you've got to do a lot of things very efficiently, lean and mean, for quite some time before you're going to get that big investment. That's the rules today. Okay, great. Thank you very much. One more question? Is that okay? Sure. 
All right, so the second one would be on the revenue project projection slide, right? You showed this huge, massive growth. The question is, like, you have to have some evidence, right? Would, the, would an investor want to, I mean, anyone can write those numbers down. Oh, I can make it look better than this guy's, right? I mean, that's just like <laughs> guessing. It's reading tea leaves. Is there a level of rigor you look for? Like, how do you prove that? How do you come in with a pitch and say, I've done this and I've proven that this is what we think it'll be and there's some reasonable expectation to get that? I'd like Jerry to answer that one. The answer is you need to build a bottom-up pro forma model, and it has to be based on as many facts as it can be, and it also has assumptions. And everything has to be model-driven. So if you tell the investor, my assumption is that I close a sale in three months, if the investor says, no, it takes four, you can change that one number, have it flow through, and see how it impacts your entire statement. In terms of the ask, once you have built your entire model, you take a look and you see where your cash goes negative, and as much as your cash goes negative, that's how much you need to ask for, plus a little margin. And that's how you build your model, and it should be bottom up. Uh, again, it's not I'm going to capture 10% of the market, so I'm going to have one salesperson who's going to call in two customers who's going to, you know, per week who's going to close 50%, et cetera. You just build it up that way. Okay. I, I'd like to make two other points about that. Um, one is that, you know, Jerry... Jerry said you have to make these assumptions. That's right, and the investors will look at the assumptions. As Victor said, the most fictitious slide in the whole thing is the finance one, and that's true no matter what the business is. The, the best business in the world has, you know, those are made up numbers. You do your best to forecast, but investors know, the one thing they do know is that they're wrong. They don't know which direction, but they're wrong. But if you are able to demonstrate the assumptions, um, then, then they will put more credibility on your numbers, or your numbers have more credibility. You'll notice in the pitch, Jerry made statements like, well, we have verified, we've talked to X number of customers, and we, are verified that we have verified they would be willing to pay this much money. We have signed so many up for a beta. We take this long to get a customer. So he was dropping those assumptions in during his pitch. But the other point I want to make is, this is the equivalent of the first meeting. Remember what I said about you want to get the second meeting? You want to be convincing enough during the first meeting that they say, oh, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Believe me, in the second meeting, they start asking all those other questions. And if you just made everything up, that second meeting will be very quick. <laughs> so um, you do have to do that homework, but you will get the chance. You can't put all the evidence in the first pitch. You just have to get their attention. Great. Thank you. That helps. And I'll add one more thing to uh, It all start with customer delivery, uh, customer discovery, right? In other mm -hmm. words, the more you're going to spend time early on understanding what you, how your customer is buying your product, why he's buying it, the more you're going to be able to put these assumptions together. And, you know, when you do that work, you need to do, document it, and that will be part of your <coughs> due diligence package that you will give to your investors. But that's what's going to give the credibility to your to your business is you understanding of how your customers are going to act. Great. Come, come to you. my boot camp. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay, fine. You've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. What's your question? I have a question. I have a question more related to the presentation of it. Uh, she had asked earlier if it was okay to not use the slides if you just use yourself. Um, for the project that I'm working on, I'm going the other direction of is it okay to bring more than just a PowerPoint? Um, marketing very heavy of this project that we're doing, we're going, uh, we could benefit from using props such as people in, in, in costumes and, and whatnot. It's uh, for software development, digital entertainment. Is it okay to bring props other than PowerPoint? Is it not okay? Is it like they look at you? I would say to a point, <laughs> it's very helpful at the start of your presentation to grasp the audience and to give them a very quick idea of what you're, what you're about, what your solution is, what the problem is. But I think, you know, beyond that, I think you're going to, you're going to, you're going to lose the audience then. Gotcha. And, and so so it, it is. I would also like to make a comment on that, that when you're talking with investors, they want to know how you're going to make money and why is the business going to be successful not necessarily about all the cool features of the product. You say that you've been marketing this one very heavily, which says that you're trying to bring a sales pitch into an investment talk. 
don't do that. Gotcha. It was more of an idea to demonstrate the marketing plan. So that's hit or miss then is what it sounds like? Well, a marketing plan is such a small part of the overall appeal of business. The investor has to be convinced first that you have um, an idea that solves a problem somebody's willing to pay a lot of money to solve. So if you jump right into the marketing plan before you've convinced them that there's a problem that people will pay to solve, then you lose them. You've got to be real careful not to lose them too fast. Another, another parallel is, you know, animations on the slide. Often they're very distracting, okay? So, again, creating, creating a drama, you know, getting re being remembered by these investors is very important. A, a quick trick like the one you mentioned could be good, but, you know, we can't say that until we've seen it and we tell you, you're going the wrong path, or hey, yeah, it's good, it's sweet, it, you know, it, it, it gets the, the job done. Uh, unless this demonstration is something that would be targeted to the investor demographic, I think you're running a huge risk. Because if you're marketing something to uh, tweens, that 11, 12, 13 year old, well, what do I know about that? I can think it's the coolest thing in the world, I'll take it home to my that my kids and they'll go, this is the stupidest thing in the world. So you haven't really advanced your, you haven't advanced your story. Your story is, here's the problem, here's my solution, here's how you're not only going to get your money back, but you're going to make money. Investors have we lizard brains. They care about what they've given you and how much they're getting back. Thank you. Money, Good. money, more money. And, <laughs> and to follow up with what Victor said earlier, the investors are buying one thing, and that's you. They're not buying your product, your business, they're buying you. And you want them to remember you. And if you're putting stuff up there that's not you, you're sort of weakening that message. Thank you. Great questions. Okay, going back, and I'm not going to deliver this because I have another question, but you talked about the uh, doing a PowerPoint or something. I'm not able to even maneuver any of that, so that would be a real problem for me. So I would be distracting instead of just doing the pitch. So I'm glad you said something about just it's better to present and have it, you know, let them see what you have to say. But the question I have is when you put the map up and, um, okay, like California has got those big, those big bubbles, you know, <laughs> and you know uh, Texas has the bigger ones, and the East Coast, and then you go to Michigan, it's just got some small ones. <clears throat> so, what does that actually mean as far as investment? You know, does that mean that we don't have much going on here? You know, are, are we're not doing very well here investment-wise. I mean, what does that actually mean for and, our state? And this is the market slide. Um, Victor, you want to take that? Well, the, number one, this is a fictitious slide. Okay, this was for the fictitious company known as NEF. Number two, what you're really trying to get across with a market slide is how big is this opportunity? It, it's not that, you know, the... the it's not that any one particular blob is big or small. It's the opportunity to expand out. So NEF in this pitch has taken over this southeast Michigan market. And so the investor side is going to look and go, okay, how much bigger can this get? Is this only going to be $25,000 a year in Michigan? Well, I'll pass on that investment. So again, this is not a real slide, to, you know, trading you, sending you any sort of data. This is a slide that says, show an investor what the growth potential is as you expand out. Right. The point is, it's relative to what you have now. Um, so bigger is more. And um, it also shows where, it, not just how big the market is, but where is the market. So it shows in some of the population centers where we know there are a lot of entrepreneurial <laughs> ecosystems developed. So that's why you see the Northwest and California. Does that answer your question? Well, then it, it doesn't look like there's anything like in the Lansing area. Is that correct? It, it, 
you're, you're taking the chart too literally. If literal. I take it a too literally? Too literal. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, don't, don't worry about there's it. Not a, there's not a real number behind that chart anywhere. This was all made up. This was a, a pitch that's going to happen in 2026. This is just a demonstration pitch of the type of information that you're going to have to present to an investor group when you're out there looking for money. You have to say, this is how big the market is, and this is how I can grow this market. Okay. Now, you know, I, I rebounce on that. Many times, uh, presenters, when they come to a slide like this, they believe they have to show the biggest market possible. It has to be billions of dollars. And what you really want to focus is on your addressable market. And that's very different from, you know, if I take the total vascular access market in the U.S., it's very different than the market I can get with a, a, a short catheter, for instance, which is my product. So don't try to impress investors with big numbers that don't mean anything. Right. Pick the right addressable market, the one you can actually serve. Ideally, this slide is also going to help you show the investor that you know about the segmentation of the market, and you've thought about that, and you know which segment you should go first. Thank you. Hi, I have a quick question with my investor hat on and then another quick question with my entrepreneur hat on. The quick question with the investor hat is one where I was taken aback a bit by another slide, which is where you showed a timeline for the company and uh, there. And, and what concerned me about that slide was I was looking at those numbers and realizing those numbers have nothing to do with your business. Your business is earning money from the people who raise that money. The fact that you raised $500 million in this year is not your business, because you don't get any of that $500 million. You got the fees that you earned to uh, coach those people to raise that money. And so I'm looking at, is that progress in a business? <laughs> it's a progress for the companies that you coach, but it's not progress for you. And I, so I was kind of going, wait a minute, why aren't we seeing your sales up there on that top chart? Good catch. Jerry, you want to address that? No, it was a good <laughs> <laughs> uh, You know, it, it, again, it's a fictitious it's business. A thing. I know, and I didn't and, want to do that. And, you know, obviously, what, NEF, what this pitch is trying to say is that if NEF coaches you, then you're more likely to raise money. And since the investors care about investing, that seemed to be a metric that made sense to show them that, in, that NEF was being successful. Sure, I, 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 I know. What, what, and, and I think in business, you know, you want to pick the simplest metrics possible that ties to, you know, that reflects something real about your business, right? And so, in this case, it is an element of success that we can gauge. I think you, you're right is that, you know, that's not your real business, but it gauges the success of your business. And, and, you know, I would rather have a couple of metrics that tells me my business is doing well than a you know, a big report with full of number every morning that I'm trying to understand every day. The two are really correlated because uh, no one is going to pay any F to be coached if they are more likely to be successful. So while it's not direct, they are related. Oh, I understand. The, yeah, I'm, I'm completely comfortable with all that. But I, it just, I'm just... Yeah. But you, you catch. It was reaction, a good catch. I mean, you yeah. got the disconnect. It's, it's a good question, though, because if your milestones on your chart are not meaningful and they don't line up with the money raised. You know, if you say we want to raise $500,000 uh, $500, now and we're going to, this is going to be used to build a prototype and then next June we're going to have a prototype, that makes sense. But if you say, well, we're going to raise 500000 now and you don't show that you're going to accomplish anything before you're going to raise the next $2 million, um, there's a question mark there. Investors want to see you're going to take the money and do something with it, and then if that's successful, you can get more investment and do something with that, but you don't get all the money up front and, and, and go nuts with it. So that's a real important thing on your milestone slide. So your second question second was as question. an entrepreneur. Okay, this, and this may be just a bit off topic, but I'll ask it anyway. How, if at all, should a social entrepreneurship pitch differ from the pitches you showed here? I, I think you're, part of it is just getting back to the metric that you're presenting of your achievement. If you're talking about educating a certain number of people, if you're talking about retraining, number of jobs, miles of river cleaned. Number of eyeballs. 
number of eyeballs on the site, on, on the process, on fundraising. You're changing the metric. Now, from a strictly an investor point of view, you're probably also changing your investor audience. Now you're talking about municipalities or government support agencies. Or social, social investors. Or, exactly. Yeah. So it's just a different metric yeah. that you need to present as your success level. And um, you still, a social venture still needs to make money enough to support itself. Right. Um, it's not looking for the kind of thing the, um, the typical VCs are looking for. So the way you, what would be a legitimate business pitch for a social venture might not interest somebody else. But it's highly likely not to, yeah. <laughs> yes. You are pitching to your audience. Make sure you're going to the right people. Don't try to pitch a social venture to a high-power VC. Right. They're not going to be interested. Right. But you know what your audience, or you should know before you start talking, what it is your audience is looking for, what they're interested in. If there are a bunch of social venture investors who are interested in education, then what Victor said was right. Okay, we can raise scores by this much, or we can get kids reading this much faster. Whatever it is, those mm -hmm. are the metrics. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to first thank you all for your insights and your contributions. Uh, my question relates to expectations of investors, and the question is, as it relates to the compensation of the key executive team and the founding members, on a scale of 1 to 10, how realistic would you say investors are with regard to paying the key people the market rate for their positions? Um, and, and the question is based on the fact that I have a second stage company that I've operated for 17 years in consulting and staffing. So I've got an idea of what market rate is, and most companies do. But as it relates to a startup, are investors at 80% of market? And it kind of ties into your comment about skin in the game. And I just want to make sure that my expectations are aligned, that for myself and many people that I know, we need to surround ourselves with the best people, and those people know exactly what they're worth and typically don't go too far from that. So if you could provide some insight, I'd appreciate it. Again, they, you're going to have to find people who are going to work for less. <clears throat> if, now, there are certain computer program developers, programmer developers, those folks can, they'll give you the number that you have to pay them and how much equity they're going to want to take, and investors know that. Co-founders, you're not going to get market rate, and I can't give you a percentage. I can't tell you that it's 80% or 50% or 20%. They don't want you to starve to death, but they also don't want you comfortable. So comfortable that you're not working 168 hours a week on this idea. You know? And that's really what drives that mentality. You're going to look for people who want to make that investment. Again, I, I can't give you a percentage as to what they're, they're going to pay you or not pay you. Uh, there's a business that I've been mentoring and coaching, and they're looking to hire their first person, and they really don't have any cash right now, but there's a potential investor. And this person I'm mentoring, the concern is, how do I pay this person I want to hire? And I said, well, think about it this way. Talk to the person and ask this person, how much do they need to survive, which is what Victor is talking about. Then would this person figure out some sort of a measurable milestone, probably revenue, that this person will achieve, and once they achieve that, then they can get paid what they want. Because once you've got in there, then you'll have the money. But until you have the money, it's what you need. And you have other tools, obviously, like stock options or, or stock grants or anything like that, right? So you're not, you know, you, you're trading cash now against potential for the future. Sure. And so the short have, answer, if I were to paraphrase. When you have investors that are the people that are working for you because they're investing in your idea then they and they're qualified folks, they have a stake in the game of your success. Mm -hmm. That all goes back to giving uh, investors credibility and a safe feeling that these people are qualified and they're going to work for a stake in the, in the company. Okay. There are a lot of people who like the secure, nine to five, solid paying job, they do not belong in a startup. You know, you don't want, no matter how smart they are, if that's where their brain is at, and there's nothing wrong with it, 
That's fine. But they do not belong in a startup. They'll get nervous when things go badly. They'll cut and run. You don't want them. You want people who are willing to take a risk because they believe in you and your team and your product. And they believe you will succeed, and they're willing to take the payoff later. Jerry's point to find out what they need to survive and then give them what they want later is a very good one. Paul. Don't like to just poke fun at presentations that Jerry puts on because they're always very good. But yes, you there, do. There, yeah. there, there is. Do. All right, that's true. But there is one slide that I saw that was missing, which is the intellectual property or proprietary nature of the business. And having been pitching recently to some very large firms, they seem to dwell on that. And so in this particular business model, maybe there isn't. But I would say most investor pitches, you have to show why would somebody actually pay for this business if, in fact, this could have been done anywhere by anybody at any time. So. Well, okay, good, good question. We need to look at that technology slide. Um, this is the technology slide, and you often say technology slash IP, or you put something about your intellectual property on the slide. But, Jerry, why don't you go into this a little bit? And, and again, it depends on his audible as well as what you see on the slide. I mean, I mean you did mention there's these patents, but it wasn't really clear. You, know, you have unique people that just can't be replicated elsewhere. A again, Paul, it's obviously a, a silly pitch in some sense. But what this slide was trying to get across is that through this patent uh, pending IP that we have to transform normal people's brains into any of coaches' brains, <laughs> oh. that's what provides the ability to have these outcomes. Okay. So these are very special people at the end. No, no. This is a special process for transforming okay. normal people into special people. Thanks. Yeah, it, it's got something to do with these electrodes we hook up to their ears. And, but I can't tell you anymore because it's highly confidential and you haven't signed an NDA. And I would say that, you know, there's nothing wrong with putting on the slide itself. It never hurts to highlight it. Patent pending, mm -hmm. you know. That, that, that's Thanks, a good Bob. Idea. My question's more related to a mechanical question in reference to the pitch. I'm seeing a, quite a few pitch presentations, as well as working with some folks that have a, uh, sitting at their desk talking about an idea, and then also talking with some bankers that are at their, at their own desk. Do you recommend for an actual pitch to have a plug-and-play um, on your own or to rely on their technology because some versions of PowerPoint are not what there is? Or do you bring in your own self-contained podium? That's excellent, excellent question because, it, again, it's got to do with knowing your audience and knowing what your forum is. So, Helen, would you like to take that? My preference is, is to take out as much risk as you can, and if that means bringing your own stuff, I would, but that's a personal preference. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask in advance. And I, uh, iPads are really good for that, too. You, know, you, you have your presentation on your iPad, and you just flip it out when you need it. <laughs> or Android tablet. <laughs> Why am I in the middle? <laughs> yeah, again, know your audience. Are you presenting it to the banker at his desk, or are you presenting it to a group of 50 people in a, in a large room? You need to know that, and you need to prepare for it. As Helen said, make sure the equipment is there. Bring your own if need be. Um, and be prepared. Jerry, you want to talk about power failure? Um. There have been a number of times, NEF, NEF is a real organization, and we have been doing pitches for many years, and I can think of several uh, times, including happening to myself, when in the middle of a pitch, <coughs> something just goes wrong. PowerPoint locks up. In one case, uh, the computer started updating, and it locked up the guy's presentation, mid-presentation. You've got to be prepared for that. And again, that's why I said earlier, you need to practice this 10 or, you know, 20 or 40 hours because if your PowerPoint locks up, like uh, Annie said, you no longer have that visual. It's all you, and you've got to keep going as if nothing happened. Who, who here remembers that tornado that hit Dexter a couple of summers ago? Yeah, uh, that was the evening of the NEF pitch, and we weren't in Dexter, but the power did go out, and uh, we had to deal with that, so... You know, you have to have to be ready. A couple of questions. One, what do you see as the optimal time period for a pitch? How long should it be? Ten minutes. Ten 
various, various investors will put the various requirements on you. Or various organization in this business competition, they'll tell you six minutes, we, 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 we teach a 10 minute pitch, and it's, it's really difficult to shrink the pitch, right? It's always harder to, to say less and more. So uh, it's, there's no good answer. We think something like this, which really gonna engage you in a discussion that's gonna last half an hour to three quarter of an hour with the interested investor. Uh, we think that's pretty optimum, but you know there is again various requirement, and you have to keep modifying your presentation to to, to meet these different. Mm -hmm. Jerry, will you put up your first slide again? I think it was your first or oh, one more. There you go. Okay, mm -hmm. it needs to be shorter than this. <laughs> generally, if you're looking at five five uh, five to six minutes, is that generally an optimal well, period? I, do you think? Yeah. I think it varies by audience. Okay. And to Francis's point, there is an investor group within five miles of here who I know when they want to talk to you will schedule you for an hour and the, seat, the head investor walks in as soon as you're set and goes, something came up, you have ten minutes. And then if he's interested, you have an hour. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is to see how you react to that and how you handle yourself and how you adjust your pitch. It also gets them off the hook if after 10 minutes, they're not interested. The other question I have is that, considering the current legal and financial environment, is it better to pitch right now a, a, a corporate structure as an LLC or as a corporation to prospective investors these days? Does it really make any difference? Your investor is going to tell you how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's depending really... on how you invest in your company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you don't see any particular uh, form of If you of walk in as, a, as an LLC, they'll tell you, no, I want an S-Corp, and go spend the money <laughs> because right. they'll, they'll set yeah. the table. If they're, if they're going to invest in you and they want you to go change it, that's fine. But that isn't what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. What your current structure is is not the make or break on, on how you're going to, uh, on whether they're going to invest. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. I got a question. Um, comment on that one. Uh, I saw Guy Kawasaki speak one time. He says he's, he always tells everybody he's got ten slides. That way, if he sucks, they know how long he's going to suck for. And he just, <laughs> yeah. um, this might be a little different. I've been in the technology business a long time, but I'm now um, got a, a venture around a music project. So there's not a problem per se. There's, you know, it's around an opportunity, and a, so it, it changes the, the you know. The perplexion, of the complexion of the, the presentation a little bit. I was wondering if any of you had any experience with something that was more, you know, uh, not quite as um, factual, technically, you know, in terms of doing a presentation. There's always a problem to solve. You just have to present it in that format. Yeah. There's always a problem yeah. to solve. Yeah. There aren't enough Justin Biebers in the world, so yeah. I have one. I, 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 I don't want a Justin Bieber, but but but, the, but, but I get it. I, I was thinking on that context, but have any of you had a you know a particular venture in that kind of a space that was a little more, um, you know, less less technical. I've had a so number of teams again, come through. Opportunity boot. problems are the same thing. You have to look at it more. You know, you know, go beyond the opportunity and say, what problems am I solving? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's yeah. the same thing, but. Express yep. it more, yep. the well, problems you're solving. I've got some why, ideas, why are you able to sell your product or service? Yeah, Nobody's the going to buy it if, the there right. if there isn't yeah. some kind yeah. of problem yeah. there. I, got, I, I think I got that. So, all right, cool. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. We've, uh, we've run out of time now. I did want to follow up on one of the last questions about how long the pitch should be. Keep in mind that every member of your audience is is coming with a different amount of knowledge about the topic. And, and so if you have a short pitch, there's the opportunity for them to ask questions. You can expound on something. If you're talking about something, if you've planned a longer pitch and you're talking about something they already know a lot about, they, they'll get bored. They won't be interested. So do watch your audience's body language and look, if, if they want you to move on, then do that. But, you know, back to the points made earlier about be prepared for whatever might happen and let the audience tell you what they need. All right. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and our presenter especially for their work in preparing for this and bringing their expertise. Let's give them a round of applause.
Tamam.